The Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Ott. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. On this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from the Idris Shah Anthology. 3. Fables The Mouse and the Elephant An elephant and a mouse who were in love decided to get married. On their wedding night, the elephant keeled over and died. The mouse said, O oh, fate, I have bartered one moment of pleasure for a lifetime of digging a grave. Idris Shah had at the tip of his tongue a dazzling array of fables collected from a wide array of sources in three or four languages. He himself used fables as a sort of Sufic toolbox, often answering a question in the form of a short tale, sometimes one made up for the occasion. In so doing, he claimed to be continuing a long-standing tradition Aesop, for instance, is considered by Sufis to be one of their teachers. As with much of his other written material, Shah advised readers to familiarise themselves with these fables without trying to tease meanings out of them. They are, rather, he said, templates designed to pop into one's head when accompanied by a corresponding experience. As with much other Sufi material, Many of the tales are humorous. Sufis have long claimed that anyone without a sense of humour has a deficiency in their soul. Their entertainment value is also the outer packaging that allows them to survive. But, say the Sufis, why would you merely smell and chew a peach without swallowing and digesting as well? Editor's Note The Blind Ones and the Matter of the Elephant Beyond Gore there was a city. All its inhabitants were blind. A king with his entourage arrived nearby. He brought his army and camped in the desert. He had a mighty elephant, which he used in attack and to increase the people's awe. The populace became anxious to see the elephant and some sightless from among this blind community ran like fools to find it. As they did not even know the form or shape of the elephant, they groped sightlessly, gathering information by touching some part of it. Each thought that he knew something, because he could feel a part. When they returned to their fellow citizens, eager groups clustered around them. Each of these was anxious, misguidedly to learn the truth from those who were themselves astray. They asked about the form, the shape of the elephant, and listened to all that they were told. The man whose hand had reached an ear was asked about the elephant's nature. He said, It is a large, rough thing, wide and broad, like a rug. And the one who had felt the trunk said, I have the real facts about it. It is like a straight and hollow pipe, awful and destructive. The one who had felt its feet and legs said, It is mighty and firm, like a pillar. Each had felt one part out of many. Each had perceived it wrongly. No mind knew all. Knowledge is not the companion of the blind. All imagined something, something incorrect. The created is not informed about divinity. There is no way in this science by means of the ordinary intellect. Point of view Saadi of Shiraz in his Bostan stated an important truth when he told this miniature tale. A man met another who was handsome, intelligent and elegant. He asked him who he was. The other said, I am the devil. 
But you cannot be, said the first man, for the devil is evil and ugly. My friend, said Satan, you have been listening to my detractors. How to Catch Monkeys Once upon a time, there was a monkey who was very fond of cherries. One day he saw a delicious-looking cherry and came down from his tree to get it. But the fruit turned out to be in a clear glass bottle. After some experimentation, the monkey found that he could get hold of the cherry by putting his hand into the bottle by way of the neck. As soon as he had done so, he closed his hand over the cherry, but then he found that he could not withdraw his fist holding the cherry, because it was larger than the internal dimension of the neck. Now all this was deliberate, because the cherry in the bottle was a trap laid by a monkey hunter who knew how monkeys think. The hunter, hearing the monkey's whimperings, came along and the monkey tried to run away, but because his hand was, as he thought, stuck in the bottle, he could not move fast enough to escape. But, as he thought, he still had hold of the cherry. The hunter picked him up. A moment later he tapped the monkey sharply on the elbow, making him suddenly relax his hold on the fruit. The monkey was free, but he was captured. The hunter had used the cherry and the bottle but he still had them. The Golden Fly There was once a man called Salah, who knew right from wrong, and who knew what should be done and what should not be done, and who knew much of book learning. He knew so much, in fact, that he had been appointed to be the personal assistant to the Mufti Zafrani, an eminent jurisconsult and judge. But Salah did not know everything, and even in the things he did know, he did not always act in accordance with his knowledge. One day, when he had set aside his glass of sweet juice, a tiny, shimmering golden fly settled on the rim and took a sip. Then the same thing happened the next day, and the next, until the fly grew in size and Salah could easily see him. But the fly had grown so slowly that Salah hardly noticed him at all. Finally, after several weeks, Salah had been deep in study of a knotty legal problem when he looked up and realized that the fly seemed much larger than it should be. He brushed it away. The fly at once rose into the air, circled the glass, and flew away. But it came back. When Salah's vigilance was relaxed, the fly would swoop down, sit on the rim of the glass, and drink as much as it could. As the days went by, the fly became larger and larger, and as it drank more and more, it also started to look different. First, Salah flicked it away. Then he found that he had to take a stick to hit it with. Sometimes, too, the fly started to look to him like something with a semi-human form. It was, of course, a djinn, and not a fly at all. Finally, Salah shouted at the fly, and lo, it answered, saying, I do not take so very much of your drink, and besides, I am beautiful, am I not? Salah was first amazed, then afraid, and in the end completely confused. He started to derive some pleasure from the visits of the fly, even though it was drinking some of his sherbet. He watched as the fly danced, he thought about it a great deal, he did less and less work, and, as the fly became larger, he found himself feeling weaker and weaker. Salah was often in trouble with the Mufti, and so he pulled himself together and decided to make an end of the fly. Summoning up all his resolution, he hit it a violent blow, and it flew away, saying, You have wronged me, for I only wanted to be your friend, but I shall go, if that is what you want. 
Salah at first felt that he had got rid of the fly for good and all. He said to himself, I have beaten it, and that proves that I am more powerful than it, be it man or jinn, fly or not. Then, when Salah had convinced himself that the whole matter was at an end, the fly appeared again. It had grown to an enormous size, and it descended from the ceiling like a shimmering lake in the form of a man. Two huge hands reached out and grasped Salah's throat. When the Mufti came to look for his assistant, he was lying strangled on the floor. The side wall of the house had collapsed with the jinn's passing, and all that was there to mark his enormousness was a handprint on the whitewash, as large as the side of an elephant. The Ancient Coffer of Nuri Bey Nuri Bey was a reflective and respected Albanian who had married a wife much younger than himself. One evening, when he had returned home earlier than usual, a faithful servant came to him and said, Your wife, our mistress, is acting suspiciously. She is in her apartments with a huge chest, large enough to hold a man, which belonged to your grandmother. It should contain only a few ancient embroideries. I believe that there may now be much more in it. She will not allow me, your oldest retainer, to look inside. Nuri went to his wife's room and found her sitting disconsolately beside the massive wooden box. Will you show me what is in the chest? he asked. Because of the suspicion of a servant or because you do not trust me? Would it not be easier just to open it without thinking about the undertones? asked Nuri. I do not think it possible. Is it locked? Yes. Where is the key? She held it up. Dismiss the servant and I will give it to you. The servant was dismissed. The woman handed over the key and herself withdrew, obviously troubled in mind. Nuri Bey thought for a long time. Then he called four gardeners from his estate. Together they carried the chest by night unopened to a distant part of the grounds and buried it. The matter was never referred to again. The Camel and the Tent This tale is handed down from the Sufi Sheikh Abdulaziz of Mecca, who died in the 7th century. He is said to have been given the elixir of life by Muhammad, whose companion he was, and to be still alive, in one sense or another, nourished by this magical potion. Other versions say that the potion was in fact an exercise called imprisoning the breath, which, although dangerous for those who do not know how to use it, enables one to put the body into a state of suspended animation. The method is used by the followers of several Sufi orders, though Abdulaziz's affiliation was with the Kalandari, whom some say he founded, and the Chishtis. A Bedouin, making a long desert trek, pitched his small black tent and lay down to sleep. As the night grew colder, his camel woke him up with a nudge. Master, it is cold. May I put my nose inside the tent to warm it? The traveller agreed and settled down to sleep again. Scarcely an hour had passed, however, before the camel began to feel colder. Master, it is much colder. Can I put my head inside the tent? First, his head was admitted to the tent, then, on the same argument, his neck. Finally, without asking, the camel heaved his whole bulk under the cloth. When he had, as he thought, settled himself, the Bedouin was lying beside the camel with no covering at all. The camel had uprooted the tent, which hung, totally inadequately, across his hump. Where has the tent gone? 
asked the confused camel. The Horseman and the Snake A horseman, from his point of vantage, saw a poisonous snake slip down the throat of a sleeping man. The horseman realized that if the man were allowed to sleep, the venom would surely kill him. Accordingly, he lashed the sleeper until he was awake. Having no time to lose, he forced this man to a place where there were a number of rotten apples lying upon the ground and made him eat them. Then he made him drink large gulps of water from a stream. All the while, the other man was trying to get away, crying, What have I done, you enemy of humanity, that you should abuse me in this manner? Finally, when he was near to exhaustion and dusk was falling, the man fell to the ground and vomited out the apples, the water, and the snake. When he saw what had come out of him, he realized what had happened and begged the forgiveness of the horseman. This is our condition. In reading this, do not take history for allegory, nor allegory for history. Those who are endowed with knowledge have responsibility. Those who are not have none beyond what they can conjecture. The man who was saved said, If you had told me, I would have accepted your treatment with a good grace. The horseman answered, If I had told you, you would not have believed, or you would have been paralyzed by fright, or run away, or gone to sleep again, seeking forgetfulness, and there would not have been time. Spurring his horse, the mysterious rider rode away. In the street of the perfume cellars A scavenger, walking down the street of the perfume cellars, fell down as if dead. People tried to revive him with sweet odours, but he only became worse. Finally, a former scavenger came along and recognised the situation. He held something filthy under the man's nose, who immediately revived, calling out, This is indeed perfume! You must prepare yourself for the transition in which there will be none of the things to which you have accustomed yourself. After death, your identity will have to respond to stimuli of which you have a chance to get a foretaste here. If you remain attached to the few things with which you are familiar, it will only make you miserable, as the perfume did the scavenger in the street of the perfume makers. This parable explains itself. Ghazali uses it in the 11th century alchemy of happiness to underline the Sufi teaching that only some of the things of familiar existence have affinities with the other dimension. The aim. It is related that the object of Alexander the Great's eastern expedition was to find the water of eternal life. They tell of the occasion when the great conqueror entered the cave in which the spring of life was gushing. Just as he stooped to swallow a mouthful of that liquid, he heard a strange sound from the roof of the cavern. Alexander looked up to see a crow perched in the gloom. The crow was saying, Stop! For God's sake, stop! The king asked him why he should not taste of that miraculous water. I have suffered much in order to be here today, he said. The crow answered, Great king, look at me. I too sought and found the water of life. As soon as I saw it, I ran to the spring and drank my fill. Now, a thousand years later, without the sight of even half an eye, with my beak broken, my claws fallen off, not a feather left, all I ask is that which is impossible. I want to die, and I cannot. Conscious that the aim must be formulated in accordance with knowledge and not just desire, Alexander the Great stood up and hastened away.
Delights of a Visit to Hell A man once thought, How I wish I could be master of the option to be dead or alive so that I might know what it was like to be dead. This idea so dominated his mind that he sought out a dervish and enrolled himself as his pupil. When, after many months, he judged the moment suitable, he said to his teacher, Reverend Sir, I have for years desired one thing, to be able to be alive or dead as I wished. This is because I find it difficult to visualize what it would be like to be in that condition. Would you make it possible for me to achieve it? The dervish said, It would not help you at all. I am sure that all experience is useful, said the man, and he continued to plague the dervish until he agreed. Very well, said the dervish, adopt these special exercises and you will be able to enter the domain of death and return at your own desire. The man performed his exercises until he had perfected them, and when he felt that he was ready, he threw himself into the condition which is generally considered to be death. He found himself disembodied and waiting at the exit door of life. A subtle form in the shape of a man came up to him and said, What is your desire? As I am now dead, said the man, I would like to see heaven and hell, so that I may be able to understand the advantages and disadvantages of each. Certainly, said the angel, and which would you like to visit first? Heaven, said the man. The angel took him to a place where people were walking about surrounded by every luxury and dressed in beautiful garments, eating precious fruits. They were all undoubtedly beings of the greatest purity and honesty, but the visitor felt that there was not enough variety in their life for him. He said to his guide, Please may I now see hell? By all means, answered the angel, and took him to another place. Here he saw people reveling and romping, laughing and crying, making and breaking friendships, building houses and destroying them, and living a remarkably similar life to the one which we all know on earth. But hell seemed to have distinct advantages. It was more interesting than heaven, and there were opportunities for personal gain evident to the visitor, which had not yet been observed by the inhabitants, and which far exceeded those open to people on earth. He said to his guide, as I am master of the option of living or dying, I think that I will now settle down in hell. Can you arrange it for me? Nothing easier, said the angel, providing that you will change permanently from the status of a visitor to that of a resident. The man affirmed that he indeed wished to remain in hell for all time. Then the angel knocked on a door and two massive demons of frightful aspect appeared. Take him away, said the angel, for he has decided to join you. The demons seized the man, and crushing him in gigantic talons, began to bear him off towards a furnace. Stop, cried the man, and he appealed to the angel, If this is hell, what was that place which you showed me saying that it was hell when it was not? That, said the angel, is not the hell for the permanent residence. It is the one which is shown to visitors. The Two Brothers There were once two brothers who jointly farmed a field and always shared its yield. One day one of them woke up in the night and thought, my brother is married and has children. Because of this, he has anxieties and expenses which are not mine. So I will go and move some sacks from my share into his storeroom, which is only fair. I shall do this under cover of night, so that he may not, from his generosity, dispute with me about it. He moved the sacks and went back to bed. 
Soon afterwards the other brother woke up and thought to himself, It is not fair that I should have half of all the corn in our field. My brother, who is unmarried, lacks my pleasures in having a family, and I shall therefore try to compensate a little by moving some of my corn into his storeroom. So saying, he did so. The next morning, each was amazed that he still had the same number of sacks in his storeroom, and afterwards neither could understand why, year after year, the number of sacks remained the same even when each of them shifted some by stealth. The Bear a man once saved the life of a bear, which became attached to him and grateful for what he had done. The man, being tired, lay down to sleep, with the bear beside him. Another man passing by told him to be careful, saying that the friendship of a fool was worse than opposition. But the first man only thought that the second was jealous of him, and took no notice of these words. He even thought that the other man was trying to deprive him of the security of a faithful companion. When, however, he lay down to sleep and dozed off, the bear, seeing flies approach, tried to strike them with a stone, and in so doing, killed the man who had saved him. The King's Hawk and the Owls there was once a noble hawk which belonged to a king. Flying one day, the hawk became tired and settled on a ruined building to rest. The ruin was, however, the home of a colony of owls, who resented his presence. The owls attacked this noble creature, who told them that he meant no harm and that he was only passing through their domain. But the owls cried, Do not listen to him! How could he have anything to do with a king? He is lying in order to deprive us of our home by guile. The Turkish Maiden It is related that Hiri was once asked to look after a Turkish maiden by a Persian merchant who was going on a journey. Hiri became infatuated with this girl and decided that he must seek out his teacher, Abu Hafs the blacksmith. Abu Hafs told him to travel to Rei, there to obtain the advice of the great Sufi Yusuf al-Razi. When he arrived in Rei and asked people there where the sage's dwelling was, they told him to avoid such a heretic and free thinker, and so he went back to Nishapur. Reporting to Abu Hafs, he was told to ignore the people's opinions of al-Razi and seek him out again. In spite of the almost unanimous urgings of the people of Rei, he made his way to where al-Razi sat. There he found the ancient, accompanied by a beautiful youth who was giving him a wine cup. Scandalized, Hiri demanded an explanation of how such a reverent contemplative could behave in such a manner. But Al-Razi explained that the youth was his son, and the wine cup contained only water, and had been abandoned by someone else. This was the reality of his state, which everyone imagined to be a life of dissolution. But Hiri now wanted to know why the Sufi behaved in such a manner that people interpreted it as heretical. Al-Razi said, I do these things so that people may not burden me with Turkish maidens. The Limbless Fox In the Bostan of Saadi, there is the tale of the man who once saw a limbless fox and wondered how it managed to be so well fed. Deciding to watch it, he found that it had positioned itself where a lion brought its kill. After eating, the lion would go away and the fox would eat its leavings. So the man decided to allow fate to serve him in the same way. 
sitting down in a street and waiting. All that happened was that he became more and more weak and hungry, for nobody and nothing took any interest in him. Eventually a voice spoke and said, Why should you behave like a lamed fox? Why should you not be a lion so that others might benefit from your leavings? This story is itself an interesting test. One sometimes finds that it encourages people with a desire to teach to set themselves up as teachers and enables others who are more humble to rearrange their ideas so that they can learn first, no matter what they readily imagine about being able to teach and benefit others before getting their own focus right. Everything man needs is in the world. How does he use it? Think of the Eastern proverb, God provides the food, men provide the cooks. Nature A certain scorpion, wanting to cross a river, was scuttling about on the bank, looking for a means of getting to the other side. Seeing his problem, a tortoise offered to carry him across. The scorpion thanked the tortoise and climbed on his back. As soon as the tortoise had finished his swim and unloaded the scorpion, the scorpion gave him a really powerful sting. How can you do such a thing to me? cried the tortoise. And my nature is to be helpful, and I have used it to help you. Now I get stung. My friend, said the scorpion, your nature is to be helpful, and you were. Mine is to sting, and I have. Why, therefore, do you seek to transform your nature into virtue, and mine into villainy? The Pay and the Work A horse once met a frog. The horse said, Take this message to a snake for me, and you can have all the flies which surround me. The frog answered, I like the pay, but I cannot say that I can complete the work. The Beloved One went to the door of the Beloved and knocked. A voice answered, Who is there? He answered, It is I. The voice said, there is no room here for me and thee. The door was shut. After a year of solitude and deprivation, this man returned to the door of the Beloved. He knocked. A voice from within asked, Who is there? The man said, It is thou. The door was opened for him. The Tattooed Lion Once there was a man who wanted to have a lion tattooed on his back. He went to a tattoo artist and told him what he wanted. But as soon as he felt the first few pricks, this man began to moan and groan, You are killing me! What part of the lion are you marking? I am just doing the tail now, said the artist. Then let us leave out the tail, howled the other. So the artist started again, and again the client could not stand the pricks. What part of the lion is it this time, he cried, for I cannot stand the pain. This time, said the tattooist, it is the lion's ear. Let us have a lion without an ear, gasped his patient. So the tattooist tried again. No sooner had the needle entered his skin than the victim squirmed again. Which part of the lion is it this time? This is the lion's stomach, wearily answered the artist. I don't want a lion with a stomach, said the other man. Exasperated and distraught, the tattoo artist stood a while. Then he threw his needle down and cried, A lion without a head, with no tail, without a stomach? Who could draw such a thing? Even God did not. Rumi The 
The Mad King's Idol There was once a violent, ignorant, and idolatrous king. One day he swore that if his personal idol accorded him a certain advantage in life, he would capture the first three people who passed by his castle and force them to dedicate themselves to idol worship. Sure enough, the king's wish was fulfilled, and he immediately sent soldiers on to the highway to bring in the first three people whom they could find. These three were, as it happened, a scholar, a Syed, a descendant of Muhammad the Prophet, and a prostitute. Having them thrown down before his idol, the unbalanced king told them of his vow and ordered them all to bow down in front of the image. The scholar said, This situation undoubtedly comes within the doctrine of force majeure. There are numerous precedents allowing anyone to appear to conform with custom if compelled, without real legal or moral culpability being in any way involved. So he made a deep obeisance to the idol. The Syed, when it was his turn, said, As a specially protected person, having in my veins the blood of the Holy Prophet, my actions themselves purify anything which is done, and therefore there is no bar to my acting as this man demands. And he bowed down before the idol. The prostitute said, Alas, I have neither intellectual training nor special prerogatives, and so I am afraid that whatever you do to me, I cannot worship this idol even in appearance. The Mad King's malady was immediately banished by this remark. As if by magic he saw the deceit of the two worshippers of the image. He at once had the scholar and the syed decapitated and set the prostitute free. Generosity The great teacher Saal of Tustar relates that God told Moses that real self-sacrifice for the sake of others is the basis of the greatest capacity for perception of the divine, the extreme self-sacrifice which was given to Muhammad and his followers. Imam Ghazali relates in the third book of his Revival of Religious Sciences how a man who was famed as generous learnt what generosity really was. The Black Slave and the Dog Abdullah ibn Jafar owned an orchard and went one day to visit it. He passed through a vineyard where he saw a black slave sitting with some bread in front of him and a dog nearby. As Abdullah watched, the slave took a piece of the bread and threw it to the dog, which ate it. Then he gave it another piece, and another. Abdullah asked, How much bread are you given every day? The slave answered, That quantity which you have just seen eaten by the dog. Why, Abdullah asked, do you give it to a dog instead of attending first to your own need? There are no dogs hereabouts, said the black man, and this one has come from a great distance and is hungry. Because of this I did not desire to eat my bread. But how will you manage for food today? asked the generous Abdullah. I shall endure the hunger, said the black man. Abdullah thought, I am the one who has the reputation for generosity, and yet this slave is more philanthropic. He bought the vineyard and gave it to the slave, also buying his freedom and releasing him. Imam Bakir Imam Muhammad Bakir is said to have related this illustrative fable. Finding I could speak the language of ants, I approached one and inquired, What is God like? Does he resemble the ant? He answered, God? No, indeed. We have only a single sting, but God? He has two.
The Design A Sufi of the Order of the Naqshbandis was asked, Your order's name means literally the designers. What do you design and what use is it? He said, We do a great deal of designing and it is most useful. Here is a parable of one such form. Unjustly imprisoned, a tinsmith was allowed to receive a rug woven by his wife. He prostrated himself upon the rug day after day to say his prayers, and after some time he said to his jailers, I am poor and without hope, and you are wretchedly paid, but I am a tinsmith. Bring me tin and tools, and I shall make small artefacts which you can sell in the market, and we will both benefit. The guards agreed to this, and presently the tinsmith and they were both making a profit, from which they bought food and comforts for themselves. Then one day, when the guards went to the cell, the door was open and he was gone. Many years later, when this man's innocence had been established, the man who had imprisoned him asked him how he had escaped, what magic he had used. He said, It is a matter of design, and design within design. My wife is a weaver. She found the man who had made the locks of the cell door, and got the design from him. This she wove into the carpet, at the spot where my head touched in prayer five times a day. I am a metal worker, and this design looked to me like the inside of a lock. I designed the plan of the artifacts to obtain the materials to make the key, and I escaped. That, said the Naqshbandi Sufi, is one of the ways in which man may make his escape from the tyranny of his captivity. Vine Thought Once there was a vine which realized that people came every year and took its grapes. It observed that nobody ever showed any gratitude. One day a wise man came along and sat down nearby. This, thought the vine, is my opportunity to have the mystery solved. It said, Wise man, as you may have observed, I am a vine. Whenever my fruit is ripe, people come and take the grapes away. None shows any sign of gratitude. Can you explain this conduct to me? The wise man thought for a time. Then he said, The reason, in all probability, is that all those people are under the impression that you cannot help producing grapes. Picture Love Have you heard about the tragedy of the little pitcher? He heard a thirsty man calling for water from his sickbed in the corner of a room. The pitcher was so full of compassion for the man that by a supreme effort of will he actually managed to roll to within an inch of the sufferer's hand. When the man opened his eyes and saw a pitcher beside him, he was full of wonderment and relief. He managed to pick up the jug and held it to his lips. Then he realized that it was empty. With almost the last remains of his strength, the invalid threw the pitcher against a wall where it smashed into useless pieces of clay. Scientific Advance a moth was fluttering outside a window, having seen a light in a room beyond it. A spider said to it, When will you moths learn that flames are hot and destructive? You are annoyed at the presence of the glass, but it is the glass which saves you from destruction. The moth laughed. Grandad, it said, there are two answers to you. At first, you are an insect eater, and your advice to insects, however true, can never be accepted by them. Second, we moths of the present generation know more than you think. I happen to know that the delicious light in that room is cold light. There have been scientific developments since your time, you know. I shall enter through this chink and snuggle up to the light. 
So saying, the moth struggled into the room. There was nobody there to stop him. No spider had made a web which might be a hazard. The moth fluttered around the cold light in an ecstatic dance. But scientific advances had indeed taken place. The light was protected by a film of DDT. Tiger A deer, in flight before a hunting tiger, paused long enough to call out to a mouse whom he saw sitting quietly beside his hole. The lord of the jungle approaches. The tiger is in a killing mood. Flee for your life. The mouse nibbled a piece of grass and said, If you had news of a marauding cat, that would be something which might interest me. The Young Sufi An old man visited a young Sufi sitting among a group of friends. The other visitors were scornful when he said, All my life I have hoarded money and I have spent no time in reflecting upon man and his inner reality. The Sufi said, Each man does with what he has what he can. Yes, said the ancient miser, and since I do not know any other way to honour you, whom I now recognise, I give you this. It is a gem which I bought at the goldsmith's. I paid for it every penny which I have saved these past sixty years. It is the best thing he had in his shop. I am too old to change, but each man speaks in his own language. The young Sufi stood up and started to rend his clothes. He said to the assembled company, You are thinking that this man is materialistic and lacks knowledge but he is parting with the most precious thing he has because of his nobility of spirit, not mine. From this day on, this man is your teacher, and I shall go into seclusion. This audio is made available by the Idris Shah Foundation and is copyright 2019. All rights reserved.